Every day, you essentially pay your dues by doing the harder thing when it's the right thing to do. Hey everyone, Dave Taylor here. I hope you are doing well and uh, got a pretty uh, good episode here. I just wanted to riff on a little bit. Uh, it's been a, you know, we've been doing some pretty long, heavy uh, interview podcasts and uh, a lot of stuff really in the weeds. And I always, unfortunately, sometimes forget the timing of episode releases. And there's episodes I want to film that are a little time sensitive, um, given the time of the year, preseason, off season, whatever. So usually you don't, you know, you're supposed to like not like share when you record episodes, but it's in the middle of, uh, you know, January right now in a season. And I wanted to have this episode because every year I get very similar questions on what do you recommend for in season blank? You know, like, how do I help this? How do I help my athletes perform better, hit their meets, recover better, not be as tired, you know, make it to preseason, then all the way through to end of season states, regionals, nationals, and their best shape, their best routine. And um, I read a lot of this stuff related to, you know, how to optimize performance and how to really stay on top of stuff. But I also like to reflect and blend on what I'm so fortunate to learn from so many good coaches, right? Like anyone who's been listening to the podcast in this kind of realm, has heard some amazing insight from coaches. So I like to sometimes take a step back and kind of package that up and be like, all right, what are the most practical, usable tips for gymnasts or coaches or parents out there who are in the thick of it in gymnastics season and just want to kind of get the most out of the season? So this episode will be a little bit shorter and just kind of some quick hits on some the top five things that I really think will help performance and will enhance people's ability to, to focus in, in season, but also just things to really think about, um, given my experience and given kind of, kind of some of the things that I've, I've seen or been through, or have learned from other people. So that's what we'll do. It's just kind of more of a laid back episode. Just me, me just riffing on some stuff and hopefully, you know, whether you're in the car driving right now, or you're on the treadmill running, or you're just like, you know, getting ready for practice or whatever that you can just take one thing or two things and be like, you know what, that's actually useful. I'm going to try that, you know, and hopefully that will help you just a little bit gain 1% here, 2% here, um, to hopefully have a better competition season and, and kind of get some more out of uh, all the work that's gone, that gone in uh, prior to, to the actual meet starting. So, um, yeah, so number five, we'll start here and we'll work our way down. Number five is I actually think has nothing to do with in the gym. And what I mean by that is I'm a massive fan of education around non gym things to maximize recovery and maximize mental clarity and maximize mental health. Okay. And so I really believe, and I've learned this from people like Luke Carson and Nick Ruddick and many other great coaches uh, around the world that it's only, uh, you can only do so much with what is inside the gym, what outside the gym is being taken care of, whether it's family or their athletes are older and they're taking care of themselves. If they can maximize their recovery and their life outside the gym so that when they do come to the gym for a meet or a pressure sets, or they go to a meet that they're maximally ready and maximally recovered and maximally focused, of course, we are going to get the most out of those athletes. Okay. So the first thing I think we need to try to educate athletes on is just really optimal sleep quality and, and quantity. And what I mean by that is there are some great researchers like Andrew Huberman and others that have really good practical tips um, to get better sleep quality and get more of it. So Andrew Walker is a very popular person who does this as well. But essentially, the highlights here are that to maximize your sleep, there are some things that can be done on a daily basis that will help you fall to to sleep faster, sleep deeper with better quality and wake up a little bit more rested. Okay. So quick hits on that one is in the first thing in the morning, trying to see some sort of morning sunlight within the first hour is very helpful for your body to kind of get in a rhythm and set your waking and sleeping cycles. I'm not going to go deep down the rabbit hole on why, but uh, it's fantastic. If you want to listen to Andrew Human's podcast, um, but sleeping, seeing the first thing AM morning light, and then also trying to see the sunset. There's uh, a, a timing uh, thing going on there where you're waking up and sleeping. Your body's getting ready to wake up and go for the day and then fall back asleep and rest when it gets dark. So AM uh, sunlight and PM sunlight is something that helped me significantly significantly. Also trying to make sure that when you do get up, that you are instantly trying to think about, you know, getting into some sort of rhythm or routine, right? You don't want to just get up and roll around and just be like, and just kind of just sit there and kind of sludge around. Like you want to really have a set routine, right? So it's like waking up and seeing the morning sunlight or doing a sun lamp and then getting some water and then doing whatever food you want. Like you really want to kind of get your body into a rhythm to get the quality of your wake up morning better. And then also having that kind of set into a rhythm for the night. And that's kind of often called like a sleep hygiene routine. So 
whether it's you, you're, it's a warm shower, right? Or you shut your computer down an hour before bed and you're not on your phone, you're reading for an hour before bed, or you're putting your gym bag up the night before, or who knows? There's a lot of things there. Um, but you want to have a consistent wake cycle and routine and a sleep cycle and sleep routine so that your body is primed to get up and go and then kind of slowly uh, gear down uh, for the evening. Other random tips that are really good are uh, no blue light 30 to 60 minutes before you go to bed because that keeps your brain awake. Trying to sleep in a room that is uh, cooler and darker, so blackout curtains are great, or a cooler temperature of like 68 degrees Fahrenheit if you're somewhere where it's really warm. I live on the third floor of a uh, complex, and so it gets quite hot, and my sleep quality is very crappy when that happens. So those things are very, very helpful. For those that drink caffeine, you want to try your best to limit caffeine within 10 to 12 hours prior to going to bed because the half-life of caffeine can be up to 10 to 12 hours. So college students or high school students uh, generally try to have your last cup of coffee before uh, 12 o'clock um, because that will help feed out of your system. Um, ca uh, caffeine is a, uh, a block. It blocks the receptor that accumulates this like the molecule that makes you sleepy. So by waking up and kind of like getting your coffee, but then having it stop at 12, you're going to naturally get your body back into a sleepy state by the evening. And to that point, the other thing he recommends is trying to delay the caffeine intake about 90 to 120 minutes in the morning to reset your body's natural baseline of, you know, uh, of, uh, sleepiness of, of, of clearing those receptors fully and then get, building them back up naturally. So that's one thing that I think alone, like if people could get one more hour of quality sleep per night, it would be a monstrous amount of help on their daily life. Okay. And so with that though, the instant I can feel the emails typing right away. When my daughter gets home, at, uh, gets out of practice at 8.30 or 9, and we have a 40-minute drive, and then we get home, and she has homework, and I get it. I totally get it. I understand more than anybody as a coach, as a former gymnast, and as someone who's working with gymnasts on the regular, um, it is sometimes challenging to get into that sleep cycle, but try your best to go to bed and wake up the same time every day. That's really, you know, you don't want to go to bed like 9 one day, then 11 one day, then 8 one day, then 1 one day, right? You really don't want to swing all over the place, and what that comes down to is time management skills. My boss, Eva, uh, and my best friend up here is just phenomenally good at helping athletes plan calendars and getting uh, Google calendars or notebooks to really think about how can we maximize our time to make sure we're getting ahead of assignments and ahead of meet schedules and ahead of the things that's the downtime so that we're not up till one or two in the morning doing homework and waking up at six for school and being a groggy monster, right? So oftentimes you can find these small gaps in the day. So say you come home at three o'clock from school and you have practice, you have to leave by four. Let's try to get home, you know, get a snack and then try to like change and get our bag ready and then just read 30 minutes of a book that we know we have to do uh, to do next week for a book report or just open the Google Doc and type the first paragraph of that English essay or bust open that math packet and just do five problems, right? Just that forward momentum of starting something when you open it back up that night or when you have to start from scratch, it's a lot easier to keep the snowball going downhill than start it all together. So I'm really a big fan of trying to fill in those 30 minute gaps when athletes can find time for homework or doing something else so that they're not up till two in the morning and trying to be very proactive with uh, tests and projects and essays and all that kind of stuff when meet season comes. And so if you know you have a big invitational in two weeks and you're flying to somewhere, you know, try to talk to your teacher and be like, hey, listen, I, I have to go to a meet. I'm going to be, you know, really crunched for time and busy. Um, is there anything coming up in the next three weeks that I could I could get ahead of time or that I could get started on or that I could I could know what book chapters I'm going to have to read and I can read them on the plane uh, going forward and backwards. Stuff like that really makes a difference. Um, and I think the more you can teach athletes to manage their time outside the gym, it helps them not be as stressed to get to sleep or do whatever throughout the day. So that's another big one. And then directly in line with this is going to be fueling and hydration. So there's so many great resources out there. Christina Anderson, Carrie Blair, Jock Eldridge, there's so many good people out there. But essentially, I am trying to over-educate people that one, those people are available on Instagram because they're experts and I'm not in that area. But two, the things they suggest to me to pass on to athletes are to really feel yourself well constantly throughout the day with a variety of, 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 of different foods and things that are going to give you energy for practice and help you recover after. So I'm always telling athletes to just be absolute snack monsters, which I mean by that is on Sunday, tell your parents what things you like and what things you want to have for snacks or go to the grocery store and help them pick things out and help them cook and help them put them in baggies non-perishable things, you can pack so much of that on Sunday, right? You can meal prep three snacks that you really love or two snacks that you really love and put them in containers and get them ready to go to pull out of the fridge when you come home from school and you're not cutting something up from scratch or tossing it all in a Ziploc bag that you can have on the way uh, to practice uh, you know, in the car. There's a lot of things that you can just cut up apples and put them in trays. You can do all sorts of stuff. And it's amazing how much, you know, 
an hour on Sunday or two hours on Sunday can equal 10 hours throughout the week. And I know that's true to myself because I meal prep as well, but teaching athletes, you know, to be educated on what snacks they enjoy, what things give them energy and what can be meal prepped on Sunday, you know, obviously dinners and breakfasts and stuff like that, you might have to cook from scratch parents and or the kids, but if they can just help you prep some of the things by putting trail mix in different baggies or putting granola in baggies or putting, like I said, apples cut up into different, you know, um, sections and putting them in sealed containers so they won't go bad. That stuff is incredibly, incredibly important along with, you know, water throughout the day, water bottle, trying to get some sort of an electrolyte drink at practice. If you have a long three to four hour practice, like a coconut water or some sort of like, you know, a hydrogen, uh, uh, what's it called? Electrolyte tablet or something like that. Like the more you have this conversation and proactively talk about performance before or in the front part of season, you get in a rhythm, you get in a habit and you just get in this kind of like groove, right? So that's a long winded answer, but I really think that maximizing outside the gym stuff is going to be extremely important if you want to have the best competitive season that you can. So I would start with that. Okay. So now we'll dive into more of the actual kind of gymnastic stuff. So number four here is going to be is that a big error I used to make is you get in a season and it's about, okay, routines, it's about hitting meets, it's about competitions, which it is, but you can never forget to neglect the basics, right? Like you cannot drift away from just the tried and true must have things in people's programs. And I know it's stressful, right? You have three hours of practice. You got to warm up. You got to get up. You got to time warm. You got to do routine. You got to do corrections. You got to get your next event. Like I get it. It's really hard, but you want to make sure that you are always making time for crystal clear basics. So just doing handstand holds and flat line shapings and very basic, you know, round off and cartwheel and just, just understanding tap swings and very, very fundamental skills and shapes that the, the, the irony here is that you think that by only doing more routines and more, uh, hardcore connection skills, that that's going to be the best thing. And it's important, but honestly, the other way is important too, which is by keeping those fundamentals and keeping those basics and clean lines and execution. That is extremely impactful on your routines because those affect everything, right? Like, yes, your shoot over transition and stuff like that's important in your, in your roundup back handspring transition is important, but by having a phenomenal handstand and working on your form and your knees and your calves and your toe point and your, and your, and your tension in your body, every skill will get better and look cleaner. So I really believe that like warmups are a phenomenal time to still just get some lines in or starting a basic, uh, you know, if you're going to do three routines on bars, starting with just a five minute, 10 minute complex of basics before you do your timed warm up is really, really important. And you'll see pommel guys do this for sure, which is they'll still do five front loops, five back loops, five stockleys, five mores, whatever, whatever their level is, right? That could be just scissors for, for, for younger gymnasts, but not neglecting that flawless approach to basics, I think is, is one of the things that I used to forget about a lot. And there's sometimes your, your time crunch and you're trying to simulate a meet and you're just going to get to the event and time warm up and compete. Like I get, there's a place for that, but there's always sometimes, whether it's every other weekend when you don't have a meet that a Friday can be a nice basics day. Like Brett talked about this on his podcast that Fridays, he loves doing some of that basics work when you're just refining things, putting the routines in the front end of the week. Other people are more uh, basics on Monday. They like doing that to kind of get the cobwebs out, whatever works for you, but just don't neglect those basics. They're so, so important. And I think unfortunately that the farther you get into season, the easier it is to just kind of like do routines and do routines and do routines. So yeah, whether it's a day in the week or whether it's in a warm up or in a prep, try your best to keep doing that. Okay. So number three here on that maintenance of basics and foundational work is actually, I'm a huge believer in the maintenance of physical preparation and uh, strength and conditioning and flexibility work. Yeah. Particularly power and flexibility work. And now the rationale is a little bit different for each. So in the first part, the maintenance of strength and conditioning is again, pop probably in line with those basics, which is hollow holds, arch holds, handstands, presses, rope climbs, leg lifts, like Nick's daily dozen that he talks about a lot in the podcast. Um, that kind of just keeps your yourself in gymnastics mode to really have those basics ingrained when you need them. But also with strength and conditioning, when you're in this phase of these five months, you're not going to be doing an insane amount of volume. You're not going to be doing tons and tons of squat jumps and tons and tons of sprints and tons and tons of push-ups and stuff. You're going to be trying to funnel those things down into the basics you need to maintain your strength, but more so maintaining your power, right? So I do really like once per week doing some really, really high threshold power output work in low repetitions, right? So what I mean by that is maybe it's on one day per week, you do seated dumbbell jumps paired with a med ball slam, and it's just four sets of three with a nice break in between. And it is absolute maximal effort, right? Because you're tapping into that really high threshold energy system that you might also need for sprinting or for vault or for aggressive dismounts or for aggressive, you know, parallel bar swings or ring strength swings by 
by doing some of that really explosive work, you tap into what's called the type two fibers and the really high threshold motor units. So those are the ones that really produce the most power. But if you're only doing body weight stuff and high repetition in, in basics, which you should do, but you're only doing that, you're not tapping into that relentlessly high power output unless you're doing tumbling and skills. And sometimes it gets a little bit dicey to maximally put out effort in tumbling passes or vault or bar skills all the time. So with routines and like, you know, meets, we want that, right? But there's sometimes with deload weeks in between, or you have a transition week where you don't want to go super hard on the hard impacts, but you want to maintain that threshold of power and med ball slams and rope slams and seated dumbbell jumps and band resisted broad jumps. Those things are just so good to do, right? And then you could also argue that if you're working with a strength coach, sometimes doing like a low volume of moderate to heavier lifts, if you're conditioned for that. So, you know, front squats or goblet squats or split squats by doing some, a little bit higher threshold, high speed velocity work, you can kind of keep that motor running on power and you won't hopefully have as much of a decline in power as you go throughout the year, which leads to the flexibility, which is we know this from other sports, but we've seen this in gymnastics is that as the natural course of the gymnastics season goes on, you tend to lose your strength and power as you get more tired. It's a natural phenomenon uh, as you get more exhausted and kind of weeks to week build up, but also you tend to lose your flexibility a little bit too as well. So we've seen this in the in the, uh, the hips and the shoulders with gymnasts at Champion, who we measure them in January, then again in April, and they're not hurt. They're just normal gymnastics season is, is just challenging on your body. So doing a lot of proactive soft tissue work and proactive active flexibility still needs to be in there as well. Right. And I can, I consider those kind of all in the basics category, the basics, the technique, the tap swings, the, the basic conditioning, the flexibility, and some of the strength work, this can all be ingrained in on either a, a, a lighter day or a moderate day, or it can be sprinkled in warmups and also done someone like an active flexibility station for beam as a warm up. Like there's a lot of ways you could sneak this in here and still get your routine volume. But in my experience, myself and other coaches, if you drift away from the basics and the in that high threshold physical prep work and that flexibility work, that active flexibility work, a lot of things struggle, right? Form, execution, power outputs for vault and for sprinting and for floor. So we really want to make sure that we have some of that stuff in our back pocket and that we're doing it again. Everyone's program is different. Some people are in there 10 hours a week, some people are in 30 hours per week. But in season, it's so easy to get caught up in just the routines and just the connections and just the corrections and the and the the meat run throughs that we forget some of the other things. And then sometimes it just becomes like a oops, you know, and then you get to the end of the year and like you're really not firing on all cylinders or you're starting to accumulate a lot of you know cranky joints. Um, I would put prehab in this category as well, which is like the the maintenance care of, of power and flexibility and prehab prehab work. So Usually, you know, one to two days per week is, is pretty standard for many people to do prehab work. And I would highly encourage people to either get circuits and print them out or, you know, make their own circuits and put them up in a binder so that someone is doing this 15 minutes before practice or on a later day, they can do it at home, something like that. But like a lot of cranky joints will show up if you just ignore all that stuff, the, the flexibility work, the power work, the prehab work, all that, um, it will come up to kind of bite you just a little bit. So yeah, hate to see people's uh, seasons end short sometimes because of overuse injuries that are not uh, properly managed. So, um, and then next kind of going on to this, you're still in the realm of, you know, uh, gymnastic specific stuff, not really on uh, focused skill work, but um, I really feel season is extremely important for highly quality focused and reflective turns. And what I mean by that is not just like, you know, in the summer, you might be doing 10 or 15 of a skill because you're trying to master it and you might not sit there and stop and think about every single one. But in competition mode, I think those athletes that can really lock in and take very, very productive turns, whether that's a warm up or whether that's a half routine or a, or a meet run through, not saying it's always going to go amazing or it's always going to go poorly, but whether it's bad nor good, you want to build the habit of self reflection and critical analysis. So whether that's with video feedback or whether that's with a coaching feedback or whether that's with just thinking about your turns, um, I find that many times in season, especially the farther you get in season, you cannot smash people in routines and volumes, right? If you ask someone to do 10 beam routines every day for the entire part of season, someone's back's going to get cranky, right? You're going to have some people who are really struggling. Maybe it's mental. So I'd rather see in those situations do, you know, come to, come to beam, do a timed meet warm up exactly like you would ideally in the rotation of whatever meet you're going to and do a timed warm up exactly how it goes, film them all. And then after that, 
have all the athletes look through their routines or talk with the coaches and then go back and do maybe two to three corrections of things that were struggling, whether it's connections on their series or their dismount technique, really hyper-focus critically on those three turns, do drills for those things, then take a reset and then do another routine and maybe then another routine, right? Then go in that order. I'd rather kind of be highly critical of the errors made and correct them than just blow through five routines and just kind of be like, yeah, that was good, you know? I think that that's really, really valuable. And my experience with coaches and uh, athletes at the national level, um, it's it's partially because maybe they're older and they can't tolerate crazy training volume, but also they just find that the quality of their gymnastics and the quality of their practices is greatly enhanced when they have that automatic mode of like stop, pause, reflect, think, look at a video, do a drill. If I need, come back, watch something else, then go back up and do another routine. Right, that kind of very critical feedback loop is more productive than I just need to do 10 vaults in a row. Right. And there's definitely a time and a place for that kind of grunt work of just getting your volume in and like not overthinking it and just letting your body go on autopilot. Like I'm a big fan of that, of like trust your training and kind of go for it. But it has to be a tug of war between actually thinking, critiquing, and being, you know, with feedback and then, you know, just blindly going through 10 routines. So uh, again, as season goes on and on and things get crazier, I'm guilty of it and others are and that. You know, you're just like, okay, we got to warm up and do five routines. We got to go, we got to go take correction next event, go. And then you come back, you know, the next day and you review stuff or at the end of practice or everyone's so tired, they kind of forget about it. You know, that happens, you know, it's just a reality of it, but I'm really a fan of trying to uh, get that, that feedback loop in place from a very, very early point. And that kind of leads to the last one, um, which is number one, which is, I really, really believe that in order to compete well, you have to train exactly like you are going to compete. Okay. And there are many layers to this. So one is on the mental side, which is what is your pre-routine ritual? Do you talk to your coach? Do you go through routine in your head? Do you stand by the chalk bucket and collect your thoughts on your own? Everyone is individual here, right? Like everyone has their own kind of swag. They do whatever that is for that athlete or that gymnast and that coach connection. It has to be worked out well in advance and done every single time. Okay. And I, I'm a big fan of that with warmups and timed warmups, which is like, What's your first turn? What's your second turn? What's your third turn? It's not to say you can't wiggle and repeat something if you need it or make a change real quick if something happens in a lineup, but generally you should know on turn one, I'm doing Kip Cat handstand, pirouette, uh, three of them to warm up. And second turn, I'm doing giant, giant release. Third turn, I'm going to hop up into a dismount, right? You should know exactly what those things are, how long they take, and how to kind of get into that, right? You can be flexible, but you should have a pre, you know, uh, a warm up routine for each event. You should have a pre routine when you're actually saluting in front of a judge and you should have a, a reflective loop that you have, right? It's, you know, maybe not right after that routine because you got to go to the next one, but you should have those things in, in place. And the only way you get that is by practicing them, which is why it leads to the second layer of this, which is when you have meet weeks or mock meet weeks, you should do it exactly how you're going to do it in the meet. Warm up 15 minutes, then do lines on the floor, then go to your first event, wait for the time to start then take your time, no exceptions. And then intentionally kind of ice the kicker as they say, or have an athlete, you know, get ready to go. And then all of a sudden, wait, hold on. We're going to wait because the judging is having a scoring inquiry. We're going to wait. We're going to wait two minutes, right? That's just the reality of the beast with gymnastics. There's things out of your control. I don't think you should throw curveballs at everybody all the time, but in general, you want to try to have at least one day per week where it is extremely close to the rotation and the timing and the routines and the feedback that you're going to have, right? All the way down to when someone does a routine, say you're in a meet situation and they really don't have a great performance, that is not the time to sit there and have a nine minute breakdown of all the things that went down. You guys say, okay, if this was a meet, what we would do is we would shake it off, make sure you're okay, mentally refocus, go to the next event, okay? Bummer about Palma Horse, we, we got to go and we got to get to the next event on rings or whatever else it is, okay? And then you would you would break down after the meet, right? You wouldn't sit there and have a nine-minute conversation about what was this on your tab and this on this and let's do some drills. Let's come back and try another correction. No, if you're in a mock meet pressure situation, it's it's all go, right? And you got to do it exactly like a meet would be. So I think I'm a big fan of that all the way up to I know college coaches sometimes will you know, play with lineups at the last minute. They'll warm eight kids up and they'll play around with lineups because one person's struggling or they'll, like I said, ice the kicker or they'll blare the music just like another team would have in their competitive routines. Um, they'll be cheering super loud and screaming just like a fan base would do. All that stuff, the more you can mimic that and, and, and create that, it will never be exactly like the meet, but I'd rather get real close 
and then fill in the gaps, then just like nonchalantly go through the week and then show up to a meet where it's just like completely different, where someone's screaming and timed warmups and this and turns and four and that. Like that's not a good way to kind of prepare. So um, I really believe that that is one of the most important things that I still feel sometimes is not done is that it doesn't have to be every practice, but you want to try to get one practice per week of a meet week that is very much mimicking exactly what you're going to do. Okay. And so that is kind of my number one thing. And I do have a bonus here, which is I really, really believe at the end of the day, given I just talked about, you know, pressure sets and consistent and hardcore improvement and sleeping and all that kind of stuff. At the end of the day, it is just gymnastics. And I know people probably don't want to hear that. It's probably like a little bit soft and woo woo, but I really believe that in the heat of heat of all battle, you know, competition, and I'm not super competitive, but I know people get real cutthroat and they want to win as you should. Um, they want to do well. They want their team to do well. They want people to perform to their, their preparation level and get kind of what was excitingly coming for them. Um, but sometimes man, it just doesn't go your way. It's <laughs> just like the reality of the situation is you do it all right. Pressure sets are great. You're doing all the things you're sleeping, you're doing all your prehab and just like a random injury pops up, right? Or, um, you, you're under the gun to hit this big vault and have it go crazy. And then you fall on your butt. You know, it's, it's just how it goes in gymnastics. You could be perfect in preparation. And sometimes it just kind of doesn't quite hit that day. And so in those moments, I have no problem with people being upset and I would be upset too and frustrated and upset, but you know, getting to the point where you're, you're kicking chairs and you're screaming and you're crying your eyes out and you're freaking out and screaming, like, come on, like that, that is just way too much. Like you're allowed to be upset. And I'm, I'm giving athletes that opportunity to kind of take a moment, go in the bathroom, be upset, be mad, but we got five minutes to shake this off and get the next event. Cause it's a safety thing. You have to be mentally ready for the next event to do this safely. But also at the end of the day, we can fight again. We can come back to practice. We have another opportunity. Um, it, it, it will work itself out and it's, doesn't mean it doesn't sting. Doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. Doesn't mean you can't be upset. But I think sometimes um, people really wear their their uh, emotions heavy um, for too long, and uh, sometimes it really uh, negatively affects their entire life. Okay, so I really hope that athletes listening out there, or parents, or coaches, remember that uh, gymnastics is a privilege, uh, not a right, and we get to do this because it's fun and it's voluntary. And sometimes that means that, you know, you're not going to win everything and you're not going to do super well all the time. And you have to separate your performance as an athlete from you as a human, right? You're a human first who does gymnastics as a second and it's not the other way around. So yeah, just wanted to kind of land on that one because I think that it's uh, very valuable for people to hear that and remember that as season goes on. So yeah, we're going to wrap it up there. Just wanted to do a quick little 30 minute one to make sure that people felt cool about that. Hope you all are having a wonderful season. If you're listening to this now, I wish you the best of luck in the next three, se- uh, three months of season or two months of season when you hear this. Um, yeah. And I hope you, uh, hope you all are doing well and I'll see you in the next episode. Thank you.